all of you uh, already know me. Uh, the title of my thesis that I'm going to present, uh, my dissertation, is uh, Adaptive Semantic Annotation of Entity and Concept Mentions in Text. Um, before I go into what that is, my mouse not working, I wanted to uh, thank my committee members um, for being here, for all the feedback they have provided. Uh, Zern came all the way from Germany, so it's a great pleasure to have all of you here. Um, the scope of the discussion today uh, will be, I'll start by introducing what the problem uh, is that we're talking about, uh, give you a conceptual model of this uh, task, uh, talk about a knowledge base that we use to enable uh, the knowledge base tagging, a system that was built, then I'll discuss some evaluations of the core components of the system, and finally show some case studies to validate the application of this in practice. That will include uh, uh, tweets and audio transcripts and educational material. So starting with the introduction. This book you did? Uh, it didn't work. You can also take remotely and just keep okay. it. Okay. Really? Yeah. Um, so first, uh, what is knowledge-based tagging, uh, or KBT, as I will refer to it sometimes uh, from here on? So imagine a developer that needs to uh, do some semantic annotation of their content. Uh, they often have uh, pretty vague descriptions of what they want to do. They would say, oh, I want to extract all entities in the text, or I want to identify what is mentioned in the text, or connect my text to knowledge bases. And uh, think of a developer that is not an NLP or information extraction, natural language processing or information extraction expert. And they would like to re reuse as much as possible whatever systems are available out there to accomplish their task. Um, they may have also a limited computational resources, so downloading and installing uh, something that's very computation intensive might be complicated. So we're thinking of a setting where annotation is done as a service. Um, so to put this in context of uh, literature that has been discussed in uh, information extraction before, um, this relates to these tasks of named entity recognition, key phrase extraction, automatic term recognition, wikification, and entity linking. But it's not exactly any one of them. Um, so in named entity recognition, the objective is to find the segments in text that mean entity, there are names of entities, and typing these entities with their type in a, in a knowledge system. So for example, uh, Dusseldorf, Germany, is a location, so there's a tag saying location. In key phrase extraction, the objective is not to tag things in the text, but rather to extract the phrases from a collection that are important for the text or uh, for a given objective. So for example, here in this text, it's a uh, fire happening in an airport in this location, so these are important phrases. Automatic recognition is related to key phrase extraction, but the objective there is to build the terminology, so to collect all terms that are uh, important for a domain. Um, while well, wikification is mainly focusing on connecting um, strings to their corresponding Wikipedia pages for those concepts, uh, but there's no real notion of type there. Um, and in entity linking, finally, uh, you're given a name and your objective is to find uh, an ambiguous identifier that uh, um, represents that name. So, um, there has been a lot of work done in this area. Uh, I discussed this in more detail in the thesis. Uh, and they vary uh, in how semantic they are, if they're just uh, mainly focusing on syntactic uh, natural language features, or if they're looking more at semantic knowledge base features. Uh, and they vary on how specific they are to the domain or the application they are built for, or if they are built from web content auto extract to the web pages as your identifiers, or if they're uh, working with knowledge bases that have community generated uh, cross domain knowledge and multilingual. So my work is positioned more on the upright corner of the spectrum. Uh, there has uh, there's also related work in the commercial circle. So Semanta, Open Calais by Reuters, Alchemy API, and Yahoo content analysis uh, platform are examples, uh, the most notable examples of these tools. Unfortunately, we don't have much access to how they are done inside. And one of the contributions I'm going to show later is um, 
an evaluation model where we can actually see the types of examples that these systems are better or worse with and compare that with our solution. Um, so I also said that uh, knowledge-based tagging requires adaptability to different needs. So a developer that comes to then use an annotation as a, uh, as a service system uh, might have different types of input text. So starting from news, which is very well-formed journalistic text, going through scientific literature, which is uh, perhaps a bit more uh, sophisticated writing, uh, tweets where it's not sophisticated at all, it's uh, actually quite simple and um, with abbreviations, with problems in grammar and so on, to audio transcripts, which I'm gonna show in case studies later has problems with token transcription errors, uh, and query keywords, which actually have very little context in this, the text itself. Um, and users might want to do one of many things, for example, find new terms that are not in the knowledge base yet to then extend this knowledge base. Or they might want to find, oh, I want all named entities, all, all people, or locations, or all organizations. Maybe they don't want all of them, they want just the important phrases. Or perhaps they have a very specific objective that they need to then uh, specify, so I want to only look at politicians who were born in Chicago and currently are living in Europe or uh, something very specific that they need uh, some flexibility to specify their needs. Um, and I am aware that there's no one-size-fits-all solution, uh, but the question I ask is can we support adaptation to different fits? Right? Can we have a tool that can be useful for many of these needs? So the requirements for such, a, such an approach is it needs a transparent process. So when people come and they test uh, a solution, they need to have a clear understanding of where things are working or failing in your system. Uh, it needs an adaptable process. So I might want to use only part of your solution, only individual components, or I might want to substitute some others. I might want you to use my own custom solution for parts of your workflow. Uh, and it needs to be, of course, adaptable to different inputs as we don't know what the user is going to arrive with uh, in an annotation as the service system. Um, so I'm going to transition now to show you the conceptual model of the task that we present here. Um, so uh, the users involved, so I'll start with the, with the uh, user that's called, uh, plays the creator role. So it's the user that uh, generates the text that you're going to annotate. So this text is then fed in through, this, to, in through a system that will tag this text with references to a knowledge base. Uh, then you may have another user playing the role of editor that can then fix some of these or add new ones. And then feedback can be sent back to the system so that the system can learn from its mistakes. These annotations are then, once they're good enough, sent to a consumer who will then employ these to a specific objective that they have. Um, so if you relate this model to uh, the related tasks that I presented before, I want to highlight a few task outcomes. So given this text, a user might want to recognize known terms. So I have Germany in my knowledge base and I have Dusseldorf in my knowledge base. So I want to tag these in the text. They might also want to recognize new terms that are not in my knowledge base, but that are perhaps important. So in which day did this occur? If you have a, a, a query for that in your, let's say, semantic search system, it's important to know this. But I don't have this data in my knowledge base, so it's also important to find that. It's also important to type, perhaps, to classify the ontological type of the things that I'm finding. Uh, for some use cases, it may be important to then resolve ambiguity. So Sparks can also be the name of a band. But in this case here, it is used to mean uh, fire, a spark related to fire. Uh, um, for other use cases, it may be useful to say which ones are more relevant to this text. So fire is a very important concept here, while flower shop might be just incidentally uh, talked about. It's not really key for understanding this. And finally, uh, might need to go ahead and tag all the occurrences of uh, concepts in, in the text. And if you look at automatic term recognition, for example, 
the focus there is basically on finding new terms that have high relevance to a domain, uh, but it doesn't really look at any of the other uh, task outcomes. So key phrase extraction similarly uh, also looks at importance, recognizing new terms and their importance, but with relation to the text. Uh, sorry, yeah, to the text or to an objective. Um, while named entity recognition will find new terms, classify their ontological type, and then try to tag all the occurrences of those terms in text. So if I see fire twice and I only tag it once, then I have a miss. Or if I see rather Germany as an named entity and I see Germany twice and I miss a tag, then that's 50% accuracy. So I need to tag all of the occurrences. That's harder than just finding uh, on a collection fire at once. Um, entity linking will focus then on just doing the uh, classification, sorry, to resolve ambiguity. Um, many of, uh, s some of the work that has been done before also has ontological types uh, explicit there. Uh, and you could claim that it recognizes new terms when it tells you I just found a nil, what's so-called nil term, which means this is a term that I don't have in my knowledge base, so I'm not going to resolve its ambiguity. Um, and word sensitive ambiguation uh, just focuses on resolving ambiguity of each word in the text, so it doesn't need to actually do the recognition. Um, while wikification will recognize all the known terms that are on Wikipedia, resolve their ambiguity, and tag all the occurrences. Uh, some variations of this will look at only the first mention of each occurrence, um, but it does not have the notion of ontological types, for example. While in knowledge-based tagging, the focus here is if the user wants to do a subset of all these things in any possible combination, this should be supported. So uh, another thing that um, we added to the model that hasn't been seen before is that the users and the objective are explicit in the model. And that is because you, sometimes when you know something about the user that created the text, this can help you to perform this integration or to perform annotation uh, according to the type of content. For example, if you know that the text is an audio transcript and it has high token transcription error, you might want to apply a different technique. Uh, knowledge about the consumer and the objective will also help you to customize the type of output they're going to have. So users might want to give you uh, a definition of their objective so you can adapt to that. And uh, by explicitly using feedback from editors to then learn from mistakes. So I will talk a little bit now about uh, the knowledge base that we have. Uh, so DBpedia is a knowledge base that was created uh, from, uh, from automatic facts extracted from Wikipedia and later a community process to then map these uh, facts to uh, an ontology. Uh, things are extracted from Wikipedia by looking, so the name of the entity will come from, for example, the title. You have some description that gives you some words and context that are related to this entity. Uh, you might have some geotagging, some domain-specific data. Uh, you have links to other languages where you have text that describes the same entity but in a different language. Uh, and you have facts from info boxes that will tell you, for, for example, the population of a city or uh, where the neighboring country is uh, of a country and so on. Uh, so this information is extracted into RDF uh, and then generates about uh, almost 4 million things and 400 million facts and these are mapped by the community to ontology classes. Um, there's also a module that keeps Wikipedia up to date as Wikipedia changes. And there's generally an entire ecosystem of tools and, uh, and a lot of research has been done uh, in this community uh, that keeps the VPD alive. The original publications are from Zoran Arbusier and Chris Bitzer. Um, our contribution to the VPD was the part that relates to knowledge-based tagging was so all of the um, statistics that are needed to compute uh, relevance and importance uh, and the distribution of semantic model. Uh, we extracted topical information and 
uh, all of the things I'm going to describe later as I describe to you uh, our method. Uh, and uh, there is a, this is also described in detail in this uh, journal paper that just came out, um, to which I contributed. Um, so the system uh, that we built uh, is called the BPD Spotlight. Uh, it's part of the DBP, the family of uh, systems and, and tools and research. Um, and it's basically working in four stages. So the, the default workflow works in four stages. So first, um, what we do is to perform mention recognition uh, where you find what are the segments of text that need to be annotated. Then you find the possible interpretations for each one of those uh, names that you found then you rank and pick the most likely one given the context, and then you tag them according to the uh, user objectives. Now you also have a chance here to fix annotations you might have gotten wrong up to this point. Uh, so it's much easier to understand if given an example. So let's look at the snippet of text uh, about the Beatles. So it's saying, uh, upon their return, Lennon and McCartney went to New York to announce the formation of Apple Corps. So the first task here is then phrase recognition. So I will say that Lennon, McCartney, New York, and Apple Corps are potential names of entities that I want to annotate uh, in, in this step. The second step is then to do candidate selection, where I'll control here for one of them. So for New York, these are all the possible interpretations of New York. It could be a magazine, it could be a state, a city, a film, and so on. Um, then for each one of these candidates, I will compute a contextual relatedness score that I'm going to detail later on uh, during the evaluations. But I basically use uh, the words around, uh, the context around it, to then rank the entities, uh, all of these candidates, to rank them according to the context. In this case, New York City had the highest cont contextual relatedness. So the disambiguation step will then pick New York City, and during the tagging, I might uh, decide, a user might tell me, oh, I don't want to see any cities in my output, so I can throw that away. So the, during tagging, some adaptation is done. Um, so a quick example from the tool. So this is uh, the interface of the web application that we built to allow people to interact with the system. Uh, what you do is you enter some text in this field, you click annotate, and this is the output that you see. So things that are uh, highlighted here are entities that have been found. If you mouse over them, it shows you what are the, um, sorry, uh, what are the entities in the VPD that they correspond to, and you have these controls where you can say, only show annotations that have a really high confidence, so that the system is very confident that this was a correct annotation or only keep things that are very relevant to the text so you can increase the contextual score threshold. Or you can specify different phrase recognition techniques or you can uh, specify uh, a Sparkle query that you want to apply. And I'm gonna get into more detail about this later. Um, but in this case, uh, there's an interesting thing here. Uh, if I stopped and asked you, all of you what LSU means, I bet that some of you would say it's uh, Louisiana State University. But it turns out that uh, in this context, it actually means LSU Tigers. So it's not talking about the university, it's talking about the team of that university. Right? Um, and here, the system shows all the possible candidates and their contextual scores. Uh, and LSU Tigers was actually picked as the top. So this is a good example. So as people are interacting with the system and um, and using it, there's a chance for the system to then learn with mistakes that, that they're making and that the, user, the users are fixing. So in collaboration with uh, Mihai Hede from the uh, National Academy of Sciences in Hungary, we, uh, we used the toolbar that they have, it's called Stackipedia, as a toolbar for Wikipedia. So when people are editing Wikipedia, this toolbar will show up if you installed it, and uh, if you click on a button, it will call the Wikipedia Spotlight and annotate the Wikipedia article that you're looking at, basically suggesting new links between Wikipedia pages, right? And then if the user then uh, selects the things to annotate, we can send feedback back to the system. 
And once they save that, that goes into Wikipedia, next time around when we do the training of Wikipedia Spotlight, we're going to learn from all these new interconnections that have been made in Wikipedia. So it creates this virtual cycle where we're learning from Wikipedia and then we're contributing back to Wikipedia with new links. Um, this um, service of feedback is not restricted to Wikipedia. It can also be used in blogs or uh, web pages or any users really that are using the system. They can just uh, submit feedback to the service. And we are working in collaboration with uh, Ali from the University of Leipzig uh, who has uh, some clients for uh, blog annotation. Um, so I wanted also to um, quickly go over the contextual related score that we created. Uh, we called it TF-ICF. It's, uh, it's a score that's inspired, uh, uh, it's entropy inspired. Uh, and the easiest way to explain it is through TF-IDF, because I think all of us are familiar with uh, TF-IDF from information retrieval. And so basically the intuition behind TF-IDF is, uh, TF is the term frequency, and it measures the relevance of a word in the context of a document. In my case, uh, I don't have documents, I have models of dbpedia resources in a vector space model. So tf is the relevance of each word for a given resource, uh, say for uh, George Washington. I have For each word that appears next to George Washington, I have a score for that. The IDF is, will then measure uh, how rare the words are. So the intuition is that words that are too common are not useful for this integration. So for example, the I we, these are words that occur with all entities, and so they're not very useful. So um, the TFIDF measures this rarity with regard to the entire Wikipedia. Uh, the I ICF that we created uh, measures then how discrim discriminative each word is with regard to each one of the possible senses. So let's look at this quick example. So if we have the string Washington, uh, and we know that it can mean more than 20 things, but I have three here. It could be Washington DC, George Washington, or Washington State. And let's say um, my distributional semantic model, my model of words that occurred with uh, these entities, contain capital, USA, president, and Seattle. Uh, capital, president, and Seattle only occurred with one of each of the census, uh, census but USA occurred with all of them. So naturally, USA is much less uh, uh, informative, right, for deciding between these two, these three. So uh, this is basically what the score captures. So the ICF for a given name, which is uh, the letter S, and a given word, which is, for example, here, capital or USA, will be the lot of the size of the set, in this case, uh, three. Uh, this, the size of the set that uh, the word appears, so for Seattle will be one, divided by the size of all of them, which would be three, uh, and then you do the math and you get to the, to the results. So um, we tested this uh, measure, and I'm going to report some evaluations. I think we're uh, pretty much halfway. Do we need an intermission? Uh, anybody needs a snack, or should I continue? Continue? Okay. So. Um, so you remember I showed you this uh, workflow that the system implements um, by default. And I'm going to show you evaluations of phrase recognition in this ambiguation and tagging. If you're not using that, then I'm going to move this over there so you can pull it out. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. It's here. So you can come closer to that. So I will present to you uh, validations on phrase recognition and some migration and tagging. Uh, and I'm not going to explicitly talk about uh, selection and, and contextual relatedness, but they are evaluated within uh, what I'm going to show you for the some migration. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so for um, for phrase recognition, um, we we test a number of different strategies or, or policies for recognition. We started from the most simple, which is just building a lexicon of all names of entities uh, in the Wikipedia, 
Uh, and then we applied thresholds to this lexicon because the larger it is, the more memory you will consume as you load it for a dictionary uh, matching algorithm. So we have, the, with sizes, uh, everything that appeared at least three times, 10 times, or 75 times, just for reference. We also looked at more linguistically informed techniques, for example, identifying the noun phrases. Uh, often entities are full noun phrases or within noun phrases. Um, we also had a uh, trained filter for common words to remove that. Uh, that was uh, implemented in collaboration with a uh, master student that I helped to advise. Uh, we also used the key phrase extraction and named entity recognition, and also a combination of uh, these uh, of these tasks, uh, these policies. And basically, the take-home message here is it's not about only about importance or relevance. It's not that you're going to uh, come and say, uh, if I al always select the most important mentions, I'm always going to get a good score. Um, the second point is the precision here is not so important because we, we can identify as many of these names as possible, uh, but we're still going to go through candidate selection, disambiguation, and tagging afterwards, so there's enough space afterwards to fix this. Precision will only impact here on the time that it takes uh, to run. But recall is very important because if you miss an entity at this point, you don't have a chance to disambiguate it later, so that will count as an error once you do the evaluation. And what, what we found out is that simple methods uh, work quite well, um, but combinations of techniques actually improve the results, and we showed these results at LREC uh, last year. Um, so, I'm sorry, I apologize, this is out of order. So this is, uh, Referring to my disambiguation score, so we also looked at uh, the so when, when I discussed the ICF, the uh, inverse candidate frequency uh, score. Uh, that's a context-dependent strategy because it will look at the words around it. We also complemented that with context-independent strategy. So you have a general intuition that some entities are more important than others, or they're more well known <coughs> than others. So if there is a Michael Jackson soccer player in the city where I was born in Brazil, which is actually a fact, um, he's not as well known as Michael Jackson, the pop star. So I should, I should use that information to help me somehow, right? And uh, so that's the prominence. And then the default sense has intuition that uh, there's a city called Berlin in Ohio, but that's much less uh, well known than Berlin in Germany. So for a given name, you, you can measure which one of the senses is the most prevalent sense. So we call it the default sense. So we then evaluated this on a random sample from Wikipedia that we held out from our training. And we made sure that the sample had a balance of very common and less common entities. So if we just use the default sense uh, strategy, it only gets 50% of them correct. Uh, and we also made sure that we have um, names that are highly ambiguous. So each, if you have only names that have one possible interpretation or two possible interpretations, you also have an advantage in your, an unfair advantage in your evaluation. So uh, we implemented this random disambiguator just to show that picking one of them at random has very, very low um, accuracy. It's only uh, about 18%. Then we tested the TF-IDF for reference as a baseline our TF-ICF uh, uh, measure, and we mix the TF-ICF with the default sense, with the non-contextual ones, and we managed to increase that even higher to 80%. And this was reported in our uh, Isometrics 2011 paper, we got Best Paper Award. Um, we also uh, tested that in, uh, the context, I'm sorry, in the context of uh, the TAC KVP data set, which is an uh, entity linking data set. So we took our system as it was, and then we applied it only for entity linking. So you give a name, and what you want as an output is an entity that disambiguates that, ent that name. And we also do fairly well, actually surprisingly well. Uh, this is uh, focusing on named entities only, personal location organization. Our system also works with general concepts like fire and water and so on. Uh, so we're quite pleased to see that this just worked. And this was presented at the Tax Analysis Conference in 2011. Then 
um, we said, well, it, we, we've observed that not every example in an evaluation data set is as difficult as the other. Some of them are very difficult and some of them are very easy. So can we come up with a measure to help us uh, to weigh uh, difficult and easy ones once we're evaluating our system? So uh, I've already mentioned a few of these, but the ambiguity is the number of, uh, of ent uh, entities that a given phrase can mean. The prominence is how many times they occurred in uh, Wikipedia, normalized by a large number. Uh, dominance is then uh, how much more common you are than the other senses for a given phrase. Uh, and we use that to evaluate our system on a geolocation disambiguation uh, data set that was extracted from blogs. So that, then again, this is different text again from Wikipedia and from news. Um, and two things that you can take home from this evaluation is, oh, another thing is we evaluated this against available commercial systems uh, that are known as the best uh, systems available for annotation as a service. Uh, on the web, and um, we, the first thing that you can take from this is that uh, our measure of difficulty seems to make sense because if you look at the extraction accuracy overall, that's much higher than the extraction accuracy only on the examples that we deemed hard. So the ones that we said they have a high difficulty to the grade are seem to be actually harder because everybody's making mistakes on them. And also shows that our system is more robust uh, for the low dominant, uh, low dominance entities, so the more difficult ones, because uh, we retain more accuracy than the the other uh, alternative approaches. So this is uh, one contribution here. So, so what is the definition of hard? Uh, is that something that is very acceptable? No, this is something that we created and validated in this evaluation. So. What we're calling hard here are, for example, Berlin in Ohio is much harder to, to disambiguate than Berlin in Germany. That's true, but the point is, is that test set created by just you, and uh, or is it something no, that's more broadly uh, used by anybody else? No, this test set was created from blogs, from the Spinner data set by some colleagues at um, Sheffield. No, uh, they're in the UK. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I forget the university. Uh, we met at a conference, we were talking about it, and they said, uh, we have this data set, do you want to try the spotlight on blog posts? I said yes. So as we were doing this, uh, I figured that these, uh, the difficulty to design big weight would be a good way to look closer at the system that we're comparing against. Has, the problem is, anybody else used that data set and published their work? Not yet. But see, this is applicable to any data set, right? So this is the evaluation that that I've done because I wanted to show that the system applies to different types of text, right? So this is blog text, I've done with wiki text, I've done with other transcripts, I've done with news. So this is just to show the variety, but. But here you are on pair with Samantha, right? The, the general extraction accuracy. In, yes. And the heart, which is a subset of uh, there you are outperforming Samantha. Right. But this also means that on the simple stuff, you're actually worse than Samantha. Just as good as Samantha on the simple stuff. Well, actually, no. I, if it's a subset, you must be you must be worse, right? I, I can answer this question. So uh, here, uh, the blue ones are the correct disambiguations. The red ones are the incorrect disambiguations. This is the difficulty measure. So things that are closer to the right hand side are high dominance. So the uh, more diff the easier ones, mm -hmm. and there are more difficult ones. So if you look here, Samantha tries to make a lot of, uh, they try to design the grid anyways, and they end up making a lot of mistakes on the more difficult ones. Yahoo loses performance not because they make a lot of mistakes, but they back out from the grading those. Uh, they, they seem to have a focus on more well-known entities. So they make less correct annotations, and they make more incorrect annotations. Uh, so overall, so what was your question again? So here, uh, this is our correct disambiguations. This is a uh, significant difference there, right? The difference in our scores is then how it behaves in the mid-range here as compared to, to Samantha. Uh, and if you I go back to the yeah. previous slide, like, uh, 
is, uh, do I understand this correctly, that the hard one is actually a subset? You try to disambiguate a set of entities, right? Yes. And the hard ones is a subset which is particularly difficult, right? Yes. Is it subset or separate thing? Uh, it's a subset. So if you perform well on the or, or on, pair, on par with Samantha on the overall set, right? And you do better Correct. on a subset, yes, it means that it. on the on the rest of the uh, not necessarily the good ones, but on the rest of them, right? Yeah. So uh, so here is actually a more detailed view of that. Uh, so there's you know there's this whole spectrum here, not only the mm -hmm. not only the extremes, but yeah. So what happens is uh, if you rely only on the fault sense, you're all, always going to get ra uh, right for most of the examples because that's the distribution. So that's why I show this distribution here. So if I just use dominance to disambiguate, right? So like there's a, a lot of them that fall in the spectrum. So I'm going to get a lot of them right. Mm -hmm. So there is a a trade-off there of how much you use of your prior knowledge and how much you use of the context that you have. Right? So as you try to use the context, you may be too greedy and make a mistake. So that's natural, right? Um, but yeah, but that, that's a good observation. I, good I have a question. Uh, it's the same question what uh, Dr. Shet asked. Uh, how do you measure how? Uh, based on the dominance. So okay. we're using the dominance as our to disintegrate form. So the items that are not don't have high dominance would be the high dominance. Uh, that's correct. Um, so, and then after this integration, there is the step of tagging where you decide which spots you will annotate uh, with links to this, the disintegrated resources. Uh, and then here, the, in different use cases, I might need the system to behave in different ways. So, for example, I can. Uh, ask only to annotate prominent resources. So I don't care about the really difficult, the really rare things. I only want to focus on the most prominent ones. Or I want the system, system to actually be very precise because no mistakes can be made there. Uh, so I would allow the system to lose some recall to gain some precision. Uh, and I, maybe I just want uh, things that are related to Berlin or the people only things of a certain type and so on. So. In the BP the spotlight, uh, since the tagging needs to be application specific, uh, the user can then configure the system to act in the way they, they want. So you can provide thresholds for confidence and for prominence. You can give white lists or black lists of types that, of things that you want to see. So white lists will only show things of those types. Black lists will never show things of those types. Complex definition of a type can also be provided. So I, I don't want only people, I want like politicians from Ohio as my type, so I can give a Sparkle query that defines this type as well. Um, so we tested this, uh, our, our tagging ability in, uh, in a news data set that we annotated, uh, and this shows the precision by the recall, and basically what it shows is that uh, by each point is a different, each line and each point is a different configuration setting. And we show that we can approximate the best precision and the best recall and cover all the other systems, all the spectrum throughout by tweaking the parameters of the system. Thank you. In that corner, I had a question regarding yeah. your uh, evaluation on Wikipedia. Yeah. So, for example, in Wikipedia, you, you mentioned that. Uh, you would tag only the first reference and not the others and so on. So your idea of precision and recall for Wikipedia is different from how one would use an information retrieval. So, so when you test it on that gold standard, you would change your metric to suit the problem. Is that how you deal with it? To yeah, so have proper evaluation? Yeah, so there are a few ways you can evaluate this. One is you look at every mention in the data set and then you count a point for each and then you can micro or average, right. 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 And then there is also a, a document level annotation which is you get the set of all entities that you have found there and then you see the portion of those that you found. Right. So then if fire occurs five times, I just need to find it once so to be correct. Right. Right. Okay. Right.
Um, so the step tagging is, uh, is actually an opportunity to then combine features that we have from the other steps, uh, the spotting, candidate selection, and design migration, to then perhaps fix some mistakes that were made uh, because we have now the chance to make more informed uh, decisions, right? Uh, and it also, of course, offers a chance to adapt to what the user wants to see as they're interacting with the system. So we're going to go now to case studies where we looked at actual applications and how the system can be used there. So first, um, I'll talk about audio tagging. So BBC has all these programs that have uh, been recorded in audio format, and they organize this in, uh, in categories, and they have ways for you to search for that. The problem is uh, that audio is opaque to you know, information retrieval text search. Uh, and it would be useful to tag this to then organize this knowledge somehow. So there was a paper on LinkedIn on the web workshop, sorry, in, 2000, in 2012, where uh, Yves Raymond and uh, uh, his colleague, uh, they worked on audio transcripts and perform annotation on that. So we said, well, can we take the same data set and then apply the repeater spotlight as is to see how it goes. And it turns out that the <coughs> default workflow, okay, let me explain this first. One problem is um, with uh, audio transcripts is that uh, it's not perfect. So about 50% of the tokens that are transcribed uh, have errors. So sometimes they make errors like, here is a German capital. Uh, if you think of uh, speaking this in an English accent, which I'm not gonna attempt, it's uh, very similar to German capital, right? German capital. So the system transcribed German capital, what should be German capital, to jam and capital. And same with uh, May 1945, we got the May and the N together here. So it makes many of these mistakes. And uh, if we just apply uh, the system to this directly, this will throw off the phrase recognition and will generate many errors in the end. So that's what they report in their paper. So I said, well, okay, so let me see if, I, if the system can adapt to this. So what we did is so created this uh, model of this instantiation of the conceptual model for this scenario. So what you have is somebody creates the audio, which is then uh, by a system transcribed to uh, text. So this transcript is actually created by, so the creator of what we're going to annotate is a system. And we know that the system has these characteristics of not having punctuation capitalization, has high token transcription error rates, and so on. So we send this to the system, and what we did here is we adapted the workflow uh, by changing the order of what we apply. So instead uh, of starting from phrase recognition, the first thing I did was to apply the contextual relatedness. So I get all the tags that are related to the entire text that was fed inside. And there's enough uh, correct tokens in there to actually uh, skew the, the system in the right direction to then get things that are actually related to that. And the second thing I did was say, no, now let me use our dictionary-based uh, lookup to see which one of these are mentioned in the text, and I'll give them some points. And I also knew from the audio creators uh, that, uh, actually from the editors, that the entities that they tag are usually people, location, organization, and uh, thematic concepts. So, I missed something. So, so how yes. did you select the candidate? Um, so, so do you use this phonetic uh, similarity <coughs> algorithms to pick the candidates? Or? So I actually I started playing with phonetic uh, algorithms too, but this is something I, I didn't finish, so I don't report it. Uh, I'll show it later. Like We got actually close enough without doing that. So uh, so the candidate selection and the segregation here, they are kind of in one step. So what I do is I get the audio transcript, and then I, and I do sort of an information retrieval and say, give me all of the resources in my vector space model that are contextually similar to my transcript, to the entire transcript. Right? So now I have a ranking of my entire knowledge base. So it's not only the candidate. So for those things, I go back to the text, and I see if they are mentioned, and I give points, extra points for that. So in case my lookup doesn't find one, I'm not going to zero. It still has some contextual relatedness. It just doesn't get the bonus points. Right? So 
I, so what I did is I eliminate the chance of uh, phrase recognition to completely destroy uh, the annotation. I, I transformed it into a bonus, right, in this context. Something like ESL? ESL? ESA, oh, okay. Uh, explicit semantic analysis? Yeah. So, yeah. so it would be a explicit semantic analysis model of the transcript, right? right? With all the... Uh, yeah. Stuff. questions so um, th there are many problems here if you just want to do direct recognition because uh, like I already said uh, uh, just quickly repeating uh, since there are transcription token errors if you make it uh, a dictionary based lookup if you have one letter missing you might actually miss the whole thing um, you don't have parse speech tags or sentence boundaries uh, you don't have any punctuation or anything you can use or capitalization and so on so what we did is we on the fly just changed the way we use the components in the BPD spotlight. And just by doing that, we actually get to a measure of 0.19. And what they reported in the paper was uh, 0.21. And this is a, a measure of the ranking of, of uh, the tags as compared to what the humans have annotated. Uh, so I thought this was actually a very encouraging uh, uh, evidence of the system the adaptation. Right, so we don't write a new program, right? So we call the existing, uh, existing uh, components of the system and uh, apply them to this problem. So it's on the fly because like, the system's running and we're calling it, right? Um, as another case study uh, we looked at was uh, name diff recognition of tweets. So this is a well-known difficult problem because there's informal text, grammar is faulty, there are misspelling, the text is short, there's irregular capitalization and so on. Uh, and usually what's difficult here is to do the segmentation of the input uh, to find which names are the correct ones. From our experience, once you've found where the name is, classifying the type of that is much easier. Um, so what we did here is if we just apply the repeat spotlight, it will miss a lot of the names because of all these problems. But if we use the repeat spotlight as is to provide tags that we can then retrain uh, linear chain CRF, uh, conditional random field, uh, name that recognizer, we can do much better. So um, that's what we did. Uh, so if we tested against uh, Stanford NER, which is a state-of-the-art <coughs> system, and we try to add our features to Stanford NER, but we also built our own CRF uh, using the factory framework from uh, um, Professor of Massachusetts, uh, and um, and we show like significant improvement uh, on the ability to do NER if we just use uh, this distance supervision that's provided by this existing system. Um, another case study that we looked at, uh, and I thought I should report this because the, this evaluation was actually performed by third party. So if this wasn't me, this was members of the Law 2 projects that evalu evaluated the system. And what they did was to play with the parameters to see uh, how they would react in this uh, emergency management training uh, use case where um, you have a lot of text from previous accidents in airports and you have uh, news and so on that can be used to then tell uh, people what they should do in case of an emergency. So this is an example of text from uh, if, uh, about uh, the fire association uh, in Serbia. And so the, this is, these are the annotations that the system did. And as they varied the parameters, they evaluated each annotation as correct. Uh, if it's definitely correct, borderline, when it's maybe not so interesting, not, uh, but it's not entirely wrong, uh, and wrong, and then completely wrong, which is when it's like a crazy annotation. And the feedback they gave was that uh, in this example, for example, the tags uh, summarize na nicely what happened, and it's, uh, this tool could be, be then used for rich snippets or for creating little summaries of uh, the educa educational material. And um, they were not pleased when they saw too many 
uh, general terms. But when they, sli they were sliding the configuration parameters up and down, they saw that a lot of the uh, two general tags were removed. Um, so that's that. Another case study uh, that I wanted to mention is uh, smart filtering. So here uh, we're thinking of the scenario of, of uh, um, brand manager who is looking at tweets that mention their product, let's say an iPad, and I want to see what people are saying about my competitors. So how do I model competitors? I can then look at the knowledge base uh, at products that are in the same category, and I can feed the system with a query that says only annotate things that match this definition of competitor, and I do the uh, annotation that will then help them to manage information overload that they get from analyzing Twitter. And finally, um, the last case study is uh, what we did in website tagging where actually, uh, so we're looking at a search engine where users have uh, keywords that then lead them to clicks on websites. Uh, and the problem is there's often not a lot of context for this ambiguity within the keywords themselves. Um, and what we want to do is to describe, classify these websites uh, based on how related they are to each other. So we want to find all sites that are related to airplanes or all sites that sell CDs and so on. So we sent these queries to the KBT system. Uh, so we split the query into entities and other words. Uh, they're there. Um, and we create this model where we distinguish uh, if a click came from an entity from, or from another word. And based on this click model, we build a website similarity network. And we evaluate this based on the open directory project that's uh, made for classifying websites. So if uh, two of the, the websites appeared in the same category, we consider them as related. And the results uh, were considered quite good. So if you look at only at the very top um, similarity edges, the uh, new method that we created actually beats the state-of-the-art methods, which is just using the full keyword queries or in individual words. And uh, the intuition is that using individual words will actually break the semantics of what things mean. So American means a very different thing from what American Airlines means. And uh, so uh, we presented these results at CIKM 2012. So the moment everybody waited for the conclusion. Uh, so we created a knowledge-based tagging model that enables cross-task evaluation so we can look at key phrase extraction, name that recognition, uh, and those can certainly be reused for knowledge-based tagging as they provide part of what's needed there, but individually they are not enough. Um, our model also enables us to uh, do deeper evaluations uh, of systems that are black boxes. So for example, Samantha and Yahoo content analysis platform that we don't know how they were made, we can actually see kinds of examples that they seem to have more trouble with. Um, and also, looking at this evaluation in, in modularized ways, we can see if our errors are happening in the spotting or in the phrase recognition step, or if it's happening in the integration step. And this allows us to adapt the workflow to then um, get better results. And I showed uh, use cases uh, where uh, the system uh, adapts very well to the needs, particular needs of those use cases. Um, that being said, I'm not claiming that I have a silver bullet for all problems, and I'm not saying that machine learning or expert knowledge or linguistics research are not needed. This is a, it's a first step towards a adaptable uh, knowledge-based tagging system. Uh, some contributions that we had to Wikipedia then include the new extractors to, to have to produce the data that we used for training this, this system. Um, we also uh, Help to, to implant this uh, or created this community process where uh, people participate on a mapping sprint uh, to so languages compete with each other to make their DBP their better. So it's like a collaborative, competitive uh, uh, setting where everybody tries to get uh, their language better than the other, and they seem to have worked uh, quite well. 
Um, and uh, so all the data that we use in the system is actually also available, which is a new thing. Everybody can now build a new system to compare with our system based on exactly the same data that we use because we added all of that back to the knowledge base. Um, the system is available online if you want to play with it. Um, all of the components are exposed as services. Uh, the source code is also available online. If you want to read and give me a hard time for writing that code, you can do that. And it's shared as a Apache version 2 license. Uh, and I want to conclude by taking a moment and uh, reflecting upon my, my journey here uh, as a PhD student. I uh, joined in 2005 at Georgia, where I worked with uh, uh, Jessica Kissinger and Dr. Sheth. My work at that moment, uh, at that point in time, was mostly on genome databases. So we had these uh, papers at uh, Nucleic Acid Research, which is actually a, a fairly prestigious uh, bioinformatics uh, journal. Uh, we have the Garza system. And then I figured that if people wanted to query these databases, they needed some kind of flexibility to change the queries that they're asking based on what's in the database. There were like 140 tables in these things. Um, so I then created this uh, knowledge-driven query formulation um, system uh, that uses an ontology to describe what's in the database and guides you in formulating your query as you go through navigating the data that's in there. Um, then we figured, well, that's great, but if we really want to cure cancer or, you know, cure some uh, uh, tropical disease, what we really need to do is to complement this with textual information because a lot of the insight is in the papers, not really uh, necessarily on the genome databases always. So we also worked on complex entity recognition and relationship extraction. Uh, and at this time, we were already here uh, at Noises Center. Um, but given all these relationships, that we found in these entities, how can we then explore all this mass of information that we have just collected? So I worked on Schooner, uh, a knowledge driven text exploration, in collaboration with Delroy and others here, Alan. Um, and we got some papers from that. Um, then we said, okay, can we also, this is really cool, knowledge driven text exploration, can we also do like exploration, but also filtering in real time and from Twitter. And then uh, Twitteris was happening at the time, so I joined forces that contributed that a little bit, but my main contribution was on Twarkle. Um, then I also worked on linked data. So in Twarkle, what we did was to connect uh, Twitter streams to linked data. Uh, later on, I also worked on uh, linked data quality and linked data um, data integration to then expand the, the uh, linked open data cloud. Um, and then uh, I finally went back and said, well, but you know, it's nice that we do inter recognition, relationship extraction, all of that, but we could do better anti recognition and disambiguation, and we could do that for cross domains, not only for bioinformatics. So I went back and uh, worked on um, knowledge based tagging and things that I discussed today, and also on uh, the evolution of the system, the virtuous cycle of uh, semantic annotations. And what I presented to you today is, uh, I think fortunately for you, only a small part of that, uh, just to, to keep it more cohesive. Um, so I have many thanks to give to everybody that's helped me to get to this point, walk to this room today. Here is only a few of them. Uh, all of you in this room helped me, Deroy, Wenbo, Alan, Pavan, I learned from everybody. I just wanted to thank you very much for this. Um, what is the guy in the light there? This, <laughs> uh, this was uh, the guy who was responsible for me to coming to the US for the first time in 2004 oh. as a, an intern in Jessica Kissinger's then group. All those, those uh, the top that's bottom when bottom I met bottom you, bottom right. and then here comes. <laughs> what is the bottom right? To? This is uh, Max. Jakob worked with me on the Peter's Pop Light uh, in Berlin. Became a great friend. And this is Chris Bissett. Yes. Sir. And uh, oh, the others might not know. And these are Kartik, Topher, and Mina. And I think, and this is the great committee you have here today. So Kartik is we will be here, uh, you know, for uh, his walk along with uh, who else? Corey and Masconi and, and, and yeah. <clears throat> All right. So I think the 
uh, tradition is we open for questions for the committee first, and then no, for everyone. Everyone, we're all away. I have a question regarding the use of, of DUP. Can you explain it a little bit more? Like uh, you use both, right? DUP and Wikipedia. Or yes. So you so, use the full text of Wikipedia. Right. So from the full text of Wikipedia, we extracted a distribution semantic model uh, representation of each Wikipedia resource. So what I mean by that is uh, there's a distributional similarity hypothesis that say that distributional semantics hypothesis says that uh, entities can be uh, described by words around that appear around that entity in a corpus, right? So we went to Wikipedia and then we built uh, vectors of co-occurrences between each word and each DUP resource. Uh, and then we generate this data set uh, that we, it's the DBP for NLP section of DBP. Uh, besides that, we also have uh, entities that are in the middle of categories. They are uh, considered thematic concepts. So, um, I don't know, uh, sp sports is an entity. There's a definition for sports in Wikipedia. And it's also the central entity for the category of sports. So that's a thematic concept. So in Wikipedia, do you actually focus only on those entities which are marked and, and linked between articles? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And uh, later on, we also looked at uh, some sort of, uh, like, so that's a, in a way a difference also from classical uh, statistical NLP approaches because they take the text and the surface only the surface forms, right? While you have also this disambiguated knowledge what entity the surface form actually refers to, right? Through those those links in, in Wikipedia. Right. Well, so the, the definition that I uh, the test that the evaluations that we did here were actually for. Uh, using the words. Uh, I did not report tests with using only the URIs, if that's what you're, you're asking. Like, if I would model each entity only by the other entities that occur, occur with it. So but you that, that's a natural uh, uh, extension that I, that I could do, right? No, I'm, uh, I forgot to say, of course, the first uh, I should say is that I'm very impressed with what you have achieved. I think it's actually almost two PhD theses, right? The, so the <laughs> lower part would have been the first one, and uh, the, the stuff you presented today, I think, is also quite quite impressive. And uh, in particular, that the system is quite mature, that it's usable, that there is a community around it. So this is a lot of effort. Uh, which I think makes this very reusable by the community and um, other people can build their research on that or even use it commercially or in, in applications. So uh, that's really impressive and I think it's going, it's a step also, what I really like is integrating, I was always confused about named entity recognition, semantic annotation and tagging and so on. So you basically clarified it in a way for me. <laughs> uh, so that's, I think, a, a great contribution, and then implementing that in, in such a system. So I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to see that. Um, another maybe related question is, um, you said this adaptability is a great advantage. So how is it with the configuration? How long does it take if you have certain requirements for an application or use case? Um, I need someone like you to configure your system, or can I do that myself? And how long would it take? How much experimentation is required? What do you think, approximately? Well, I mean, I think that the number of people that have used the system, right, including it in the LA2 project, I think shows that this is not an impossible task. It's, you don't need me to do it, so people can figure it out. So we try to have documentation also on how to do these things. Uh, so a lot of people just come and they use it and we don't ever hear that they're using the system because they just figured out how to configure it. I almost made it a bit harder so that people would ask me questions so I would know they're using the system. Uh, but I think that, um, especially in that uh, web interface that I showed, uh, since you have sliders that even if you don't know what it means, you can just click and things move around. You're like, oh, things are disappearing or things are appearing. Uh, I think it makes it uh, fairly easy to, to use. So, so what do you configure, a position recall kind of thing? Right, so you configure 
for example, the confidence. The confidence would be something that would uh, play with the trade-off of precision and recall, right? So you say, only give me things where the system is really, really sure that that's correct. And so that will, of course, output less annotations, but the ones that are going to come out are going to be more precise. Uh, there are other configuration uh, parameters. You could say, I only want named entities, people, location, organization. Don't tag anything else. So you can give these types as a white list, and then the system will do that. So certain things, like, for example, giving a Sparkle query for the system to, to filter, those require more knowledge. So they might be a bit more involved. Um, but, uh, or if you need to change the order of the workflow, then you might need to understand a little bit that the system does have all these, these things. But once you know that, it's a, it's a matter of giving XML, doing something with it, giving it back to the system, and we go from there. So I noticed at least two dimensions of adaptation. Uh, let's review them, and let's see if I, there's something else that you missed out on, or, or at least I missed out on getting. So one adaptation was, you just say that I just want name entity, uh, uh, you know, uh, or something else. Yeah. I could choose to get what I want in terms of annotations. Yes. Right? The multiple uh, aspects of it. <laughs> the other adaptation aspect that I noticed was uh, the um, your workflow pipeline kind of thing. So in the audio example, you say I, uh, uh, you know, I went in this order to solve the problem. So that is another aspect for adaptation. Is there anything else that I missed out? Uh, well, and the uh, the other one is the in, the kinds of input text, right? So it's uh, yeah, but uh, the computational. So you're saying like what you do to the system? Mm. Yeah. Um, the confidence, so which will mm. play around with precision recall. That is one kind of yeah. one kind of adaptation. That's configuration of the Yeah, I have a technical question for you. So what's the relationship between uh, LSA and distribution of semantic? So LSA is a dimensionality reduction. Yeah, but they also should try to understand the similarity based on what other words co-occur with it, right? Right. But it's, it's almost like taking, I mean, building a model out of the distribution of semantics, right? So I would say LSA is a type of distribution of semantics. And then, uh, yeah, that is absolutely correct. Uh, yes. well, so distribution of semantics, it's uh, the, the term was coined by John Rupert Firth, uh, who did some seminal work on the context sensitive nature of meaning. Essentially, he says that to truly understand the word, you need to understand its context. <coughs> uh, LSA and some other things, they, they try to do that by using frequencies. But distributional semantics can be defined in terms of any any number of representations for context. So LSE is just one. Any similarity in this Yeah, in my understanding of it is a concrete embodiment of a general concept. Right. One of So you asked us to drill your own. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, I don't know which slide it was. You were comparing entity linking any uh, and Recognize node terms? Well, it's. See, the, the, the point I want to make is not that they can't, it's that they don't. It's not they're going for it. Oh, okay. Right? So, if. So, NER doesn't use any knowledge of what terms are already known. Actually, there, you could use as a feature, for example, say, give a, a gazetteer of the names of people. Oh, right. You could use that. Oh, so, right. I mean, perhaps I should. Make, create a symbol here. It's not that it's not going to find new terms, but it's not trying that. It's actually just trying to find all of entities there. Right? Um, in this case, it's, like, it's definitely new terms. 
because it's trying to create a terminology. You don't have anything to start with. Uh, and especially in this case of the name depth recognition, you could be starting from something that you already know and use that to, to extract. And uh, what's the difference between prominence and dominance? Prominence is the, um, how common it is in the collection. So Berlin is more common than Wright State University. Right. But they're not actually referring to the same. There's no name that refers to these two entities. Dominance is, given the string Berlin, out of all of the senses, which ones are, which one is more dominant than the others? So for Berlin, Germany, between Berlin, Germany and Berlin, Ohio. And that is a distinction. So you could use the prominence as a simplification of the dominance, but that's a gross simplification because you actually have the, um, if you have the knowledge that Berlin can mean these things, so now you can make more of a refined statement about are you saying you can get provenance without uh, uh, background knowledge uh, and your dominance must have background knowledge to have all the senses? Or Correct. Is some other way of doing the senses? Correct. More questions? So, uh, you, you had a collaborator, right? The one uh, in the bottom right corner. Uh, I had many collaborators. Okay, uh, but in terms of who are the co core implementers of the WPS Spotlight? Uh, I implemented the core of the WPS Spotlight. Uh, since then, we had contributions from many people. There are a lot of things I don't report here. So at the Google Summer of Code, we got some funding from Google to uh, have four students working with us during the summer. So they also worked on other types of uh, disambiguation. Um, what, so a few of them have become committers. So what you see now as a product would be a spotlight. So especially uh, the multilingual things that we reported in iSemantics were actually implemented by Joe. So I was uh, I conceptually uh, modeled the things. We discussed a lot, but he actually gave a lot of no the original to that. I'm talking about original four. It was me. Uh, Max was uh, the DBpedia guy at the time. So he worked a lot on uh, implementing the extractors that we needed based on what we define. So I have another question. If you look um, look forward, so your system seems to be um, using more semantics than, than previously in many other systems which were there for named entity recognition, for example. So exploiting uh, DBpedia as background knowledge, right? So, but uh, it still also uses text, uh, the text, um, do you think it would be feasible to actually build a system which only uses knowledge bases and background knowledge? And um, So, yeah, so uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. Actually, I, uh, I would argue that, that there are other systems that use probably more semantics than what uh, he has used and it should be well aware of if you read the score, uh, you know, okay, in 2002. Um, had very rich uh, ontology model, and because they were deep domain models, in DBpedia obviously you have to you depend upon what is in the Wikipedia in a way. Uh, while in the score, uh, you know, Vocate score or semantic freedom, uh, they were specific domain models, a financial services model or uh, a model for entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, whatever the customer or the business wants, whatever level of depth you want, you can model that. And uh, the relationships were far richer than anything you would have here because this is broad. Uh, but in the, in the broad systems, yes, I think you can take the claim of this being richer uh, versions. In a domain specific context, there were richer semantic systems and hence there were more knowledge base contribution right. to annotations than even you can get here. So that is that of. But in is a web based system, is a web uh, scale system, yes, that, that uh, for this one will take the claim. Tapping this uh, intelligence wisdom of the crowd, basically, ah, yeah, the Wikipedia is also context, yes. evoluti evolution. Um, like like Wikipedia changes, it covers more domains mm. and more different languages, yes. right? So, how many different languages do we have? Two hundred in Wikipedia, and yes. it's relatively easy to port Spotlight to new languages. Yeah. And that would be very time-consuming, which which 
Oh yeah, then it is not meant for that. It is a different, you know, it is a very uh, domain specific applications. Mm -hmm. Anti-money laundering or know your customers or these are the kind of class where you really have to know the domain in much more depth yeah. for business application versus here which is more serving uh, better search or better browsing or better better. Yeah, so, so answer the question, I, I think uh, it could, and especially for the more common things. So uh, one problem that uh, will show up when wants to try to use only knowledge bases is sparsity. Because, we, for example, we don't have type for all of the entities. Uh, we don't have mapped properties for all of the entities. So we have like a high coverage, like 70% or something, or 80%, but um, we don't have for all of them. Uh, so for the more common things, I do think you can just use the knowledge base and actually do fairly well. Um, for the less common things or the things that are not so structured in Wikipedia, those are more challenging. And so the approach that I tried to take here was to like, kind of bridge this gap between like, oh, we are text people, we are knowledge base people, and say, hey, but I can also extract knowledge from text and then put this back in the ontology. So you know, this measure that a certain uh, entity is more prominent than the other is a fact that has been added back to the repeater. Not all of this is loaded in the main endpoint, so there's a difference between what I consider the DBpeter data sets and what is the deployed link data DBpeter. They have restrictions there for size and, and all of that. But um, so, you know, so a lot of this is actually, I consider knowledge that is like qu quantify, quantifiable, qu quantified knowledge, right? So, not only qualitative, uh, what is the qualitative, what is the other word? Quantitative, thank you. Right, so like this, this, this entity is more often related to this. So, uh, so looking forward, I think it would be useful to both extend more of the structured knowledge, but also look at more ways in which we can have uh, more, uh, more perhaps imprecise knowledge and more quantified knowledge also showing up in knowledge bases, I think that would be um, will be very useful. Yes. I mean, one thing when you're doing annotation, I think context is very important. So that's what it is, but like, it's a pretty good job in that. But in that, is it is it possible to bias it to a certain domain? For example, if I'm doing yes. annotation for uh, music domain, yes. or it's in use or sports domain, right. I can bias it. So the knowledge base, it's, though it uses Wikipedia, but the, a part of Wikipedia right. which is more you know towards the domain. Center, I think it can do better job in that. So that's why then the second, can we change uh, knowledge base here? Instead of using the Wikipedia, can we depend on some other knowledge base? So that okay. also addresses this core uh, system that I'm like music right? so, yeah, the, fir so the first fast. question is, yeah, we've been looking into that. So uh, I advised uh, Dirk uh, during uh, Google Summer of Code, and that was his project actually, to first do topic classification of what's coming in and say this is music or sports then use that to bias what came out. Uh, I don't report it here though, um, but we still want to write a paper about that. Uh, so yeah, so that helps a lot, right? Because first, you cut down your space, so that's much faster. So you can actually think about having like an implementation side, having different uh, sub-knowledge bases for each domain, right? That you can then do this maybe equation much right. quicker. And there yeah. may be specific nuances with respect to domains so that can be leveraged. Yeah. So yeah, so we, we looked a little bit into that. Uh, we don't have a final answer. Uh, for the second question, yes, you could. So this, you know, it operates over a knowledge base. Uh, we focus on DBpedia uh, because of all the characteristics that I described to you. I thought it, would, uh, it was a, an interesting solution. Uh, Implementation-wise, you could feed other data. We have specific formats. We read things from uh, tri RDF triples or from TSV files and build the system from that. Actually, we tested with a company in Brazil uh, building for, for their knowledge base. So you may remember the old slides uh, in the Sebagics and even before that, the Tali, uh, where we had we'll, content comes in, we'll classify into different domains. Mm -hmm. So you have um, uh, you know Joe White in business and Joe White in baseball. But because classifier has already identified that this is baseball, now I'm going to know I'm going to say this is Joe White in baseball, not Joe White in business, right? Do it. Yeah. So that before he asked the second question, I was actually going to say that, and this has been done twice before me within this group. So it was the score and uh, semantics, and uh, Mina also used the knowledge that it was a music domain to do her uh, 
specific an in depth recognition for that particular domain. Right? Because it may be then we can capture domain specific yeah. in the processing itself. Yeah, so we would like to like make this a little bit more automatic than both Semagics and uh, Mina's work, but we're not done with that side. That's future work. So, uh, in our dry run yesterday, there was one thing we talked about that I, I thought you were squeezing, but it's missing, so I'll ask you. Uh, it was Yago. Oh, I put it there. No, I missed it. I put it there. Oh. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, so Yago extracts the knowledge base from the text, right? So it's different from Wikipedia, as Aaron was saying, uh, and BBP, uh, different from BBpedia, uh, where we have a knowledge base where the community is building and mapping uh, the, the structured triples to this ontology that has been uh, thought out, like created by people, and try, we try to keep it uh, uh, consistent. Right? So it's different from Yago, which is much more uh, free extraction of facts that they can get from text. So sometimes they have some types that are, they look more like queries than actually types. They're like people that have lived in Dayton, Ohio, and got a PhD. Like, so it's kind of a, a different approach. How would you? There is also Gate, right? So, uh, so Gate is, is uh, the, or you email? Why are they not in here? Yeah, so so Gate would fit here. Uh, is a, or is I guess I guess specific? no. I guess I guess it's not Gate. Gate any. So Gate has a component mm -hmm. that does name depth recognition. Mm -hmm. Gate and UEMA, they're not. Uh, in yeah, mm -hmm. they they're a place for cool you to create this. tools that do these things. Right. So they're frameworks. And do you know basis tech? That's uh, really commercial, but it's not like a web, uh, not an annotation as a service, but they provide this as a software. Basis tech. Yeah, it's cool. a U.S. company. They are do you know the name of the company? Is it a language corporation? No, they are called basis tech. Oh, then I don't know. And I only know that they are. Their, their product uh, is used in, in many large companies, like this Daimler, for example. Yeah. But, um, so they license also named entity recognition technology. And, um, would have been would be interesting how this compares. But can we compare? Like, can we get a hold of that? Or that would be. That's the problem with commercial, right? Yeah. Um, some some of these uh, commercial companies that we can't ever see their. Um, their tools, uh, they actually participate in, in challenges. So in Tech KVP, there's this language corporation who did really well uh, in like people recognition that can do like, like 90 something percent, but they, they have been working with the US military for 20 years now on rule based systems and you know like, so it's, and they only do personal location organization as far as I know, right? So like this is, this is different from the traditional information extraction approaches that are very focused to something that tries to do like as much as possible, right? And as you go for breadth, then it gets complicated. I, IBM has one of those two, which does only people in the system, It has a very high accuracy. System T? Yeah. I think so. They, they, they are a company actually for that. They are address actually. Yeah. It's a company. Well, okay, uh, so we'll excuse the community.